Good afternoon, and welcome to the College of Engineering's Lunch and Learn featuring Dean John English. And as I mentioned, it's great to see so many folks here with us. Uh, I think Dean English might be just a little bit popular. Um, so Dean English, welcome, and thank you for being here with us today. Pleasure. My pleasure. Um, and special thanks also to the team at the Arkansas Alumni Association for setting this up. This is part of their Arkansas Alumni Presents series. So uh, be sure to head to ArkansasAlumni.org to see all the other events on the calendar that are part of that series. Um, for all of our civil engineering folks, uh, tonight at five o'clock, there's a civil engineering happy hour and a sneak peek tour of CREC, the Civil Engineering Research and Education Center uh, with its director, Gary Prince. So um, pretty cool opportunity there among the other events. Uh, but my name is Nick DeMoss. I'm the Director of Communications for the College of Engineering, and I, if you haven't guessed, will be the host of today's program. Um, as you can imagine, today is a uh, pretty special event for those of us in the College of Engineering. Uh, this is one of Dean English's last public events before he starts his new role as Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation on Monday. Uh, so with, with that in mind, today's format's going to be a little different than a normal lunch and learn. Uh, we're not going to have any PowerPoint slides or anything like that. I know you're all disappointed, but uh, instead this is going to be more like an interview. So I've prepared some questions for Dean English. Uh, they focus on his time as Dean, talk about the state of the college today, and then also look forward toward his new role as Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation. So uh, we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. You can just drop those in the chat box and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, so without further ado, we'll get started. Um, so Dean English, thanks again for being here with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And I also, I don't know what questions Nick is going to ask. So it could also be thought that this is his last chance to get me one. So uh, we'll see what he, see what he does. I, I really don't know what he's going to ask. So I, I, I can assure you it's, it's full of difficult gotcha questions. Um, just, just as we discussed. Just the way you are, Nick. I know, I know. Um, so, so the first question here, uh, sort of a general question, but you, you returned to the University of Arkansas as Dean of Engineering in 2013. Um, and I'm sure that seems like it was both yesterday and like it was a million years ago. Um, but my first question is, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen during the last seven plus years in the College of Engineering? Yeah. Wow, that, that's a great question, Nick. And um, this was kind of think through the you know, when I came in here, one of the first things I had seen, I remember one of my number one mentors professionally was the uh, the dean that preceded me, Ashok Saxena, and he was one that was the author of our first year experience, pro experience program, our engineering career awareness program that have been actually transformational in view of changing our student diversity and uh, retention of engineering students, which is a tough gig in, in engineering. But one of the things I noticed quickly was that I um, that had seen that had not seen any growth in the faculty and staff since I had, had been at left here in 2007. And so um, and so basically one of the first things we did is, you know, and one nice thing when you hire somebody who's been doing a job like this and I've been doing it at K-State for six years is you take you're a little less risk adverse. And so I said, let's find every nickel and dime we can find and let's head down a hiring path. And we have added, I think, a total of uh, pushing 45 new faculty. Of course, we do allow people to retire. And uh, so there have been some retirements that have gone on. So we've, we've seen a very nice increase, about 20% of our faculty size and a commensurate growth in view of our staff. And so uh, I think that's one big one that we see. Um, I think another, as we think about, I, I, I think that we have grown in view of our orientation towards inclusion and equity and that's probably been uh, more, more recent in the last couple of years uh, have done a lot of um, uh, some training by that, that, that we've had a lot of success with and then also just advocating by action and placing in uh, processes in place requirements and searches uh, that, that sometimes are not real well received but I, it has been, it set some staggering years of recruitment. Uh, one year I can remember one of the departments, chemical engineering, to name them, a shout out to them. They, they hired uh, two, and, and they took advantage of a certain couple of circumstances to make this happen. Um, and certainly being the advocate of, of inclusion as I am, uh, it was the year that the, the hurricanes hit the Puerto Rican islands. And, um, and they, you know, 
basically went shopping in Puerto Rico and brought in two new faculty members from uh, uh, Manuez uh, in Puerto Rico, major university down there. And then also I uh, had an opportunity to hire an outstanding faculty member from here in the US, uh, a woman of color. And so we had a staggering year and we've seen things like that where an entire recruiting class sometimes have been all women or uh, I know biomedicals had that happen. And so those kind of things I started seeing happening and I don't take credit for that. You know, it, it's, that's the leadership of the department heads making that. And likewise in hiring, I can only hand them resources if the department heads and faculty and staff don't zoom in to try to make a difference in hiring, uh, they won't do it. You know, in, in my world is that, you know, the classic way of hiring was to advertise the trade magazines and you know, people apply. You can't do that anymore. You have to use modern, aggressive approaches to recruitment. I've seen great success in view of that. And I think the last thing I'll add, Nick, and because there's probably other questions, I'm really, really, really excited about our new data science program. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with what's been going on, this is a, a program that bridges three different colleges, the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences, the Walton College of Business, and then the College of Engineering. And if you're in that space at all, you know, data science is the rage right now. I mean, the demand for these technical skills is, is, is through the roof. And, uh, and the nature of data science, years ago, we were thinking of it as like big data and principally coming out of either industrial engineering or statistics, but it has morphed into every aspect of, of the academy and also in industry. It's in retail, it's in food sciences, it's in sociology, it, you know, it's in the classic space of, of mining data. And so it goes everywhere. And so what we've rolled out is a data science program that, that looks like a math, statistics, industrial engineering, computer science, first two years. And then they launch into a dozen or so different disciplines, including sociology, including industrial or operations for industrial engineering, the cyber area for computer science. And without much advertising at all, we have 32 students in that program this fall. And I think that's transformational. And it also oozes of, North, of, of the community of Arkansas. If we're hot in one area, it's in the space of big data. And you think all the way from the Walmart Corporation and their needs for big data and mining information to uh, startup companies like First Orion with Charlie Morgan down in Little Rock. This is a space we work in. And uh, we all have memories of Axion being formed. And they were doing big data before it was termed big data. And so it's always been a space that we've participated in. I've also heard Northwest Arkansas has the potential of being the big data, data science mecca of like Silicon Valley is to uh, fabrication of electronic devices. So it's a really exciting place to be in. And so those will be my top three. If you give me much longer, Nick, I'll have more and then we'll run out of time. So <laughs> that that's fair enough. That That's excellent. Um, thank you for that. So, so we ask about the biggest changes you've seen. What, what are some things that haven't changed during your time as Dean? What's been consistent throughout your time at the College of Engineering? Well, um, well, hopefully, well, we, we, I, I would have said football, but thank goodness that seems to have changed now. So that's off my list. So I can't talk about football and being the Razorback. I, mean, I was a kid that growing up, I was in the backyard with my radio and my football pads and a helmet pretending I was Ike Forte. So when the Razorbacks lose, I still, it's like I'm eight years old. I am bummed out Monday through Thursday the following week. It just bums me out when the Razorbacks lose. And thank goodness Coach Pittman has put us on a track of winning so that's not on my list anymore nick it would have been last fall but not now i mean this this is feeling really good i just wish we could all go to the stadium now um you know um i i'm glad to say that one trend that has seemed to have stopped is i think you know engineering obviously today i'm still dean of engineering now monday i've got to be more party neutral but you know one of the things that i and, and i've got my good friend chris weiser on the phone and he if he would take a microphone he'd say we need a mechanical engineering building really bad um and and bob harrison would say that oh yeah thanks bill i'll, I'll get all these hands waved for mechanical and we do we desperately, I have not seen any change in mechanical engineering traction and, and, you know, and building a new engineering building. But one of the things we have done is we, we're now building a new structures lab on the south end of town. And that's civil engineering. Mechanicals are welcome to play in the space if they like. But if you have any impression what they do, it, it has concrete floors that will be on the order. I'm going to get this wrong. We criticized by the civils. 
probably four or five feet deep with, with reinforced steel on order of inches. And they have these holes that are drilled that go through and they're not just normal holes. They're capable of bending commercial size uh, girders and, and, and beams. I mean, the big ones you see like in high rises. And so this is a big deal, powerful room uh, that we are in progress of building on the south side of town. Uh, we finally have some growth in, in some engineering facility space. I'm excited about that. You know, um, slower than I desire, Nick, is our efforts of all things tied to equity and inclusion. Uh, I do think we've seen some motion in place, but I think we have a lot more to do. And we're reminded of, of the events of the summer uh, that we do have work ahead of us and moving forward as a university of being inclusive. And I, you know, I, and I know that Dean Needy, who's going to come in and replace me, who's a dear friend, is going to do a great job. She's going to follow on before we're going in view of that. And I also see it being a huge priority with the university coming right out of the chancellor's office. And so I think that's one of those things that's going to pick up speed a lot in the next three to five years. And, and we're, it's time. It's time for that to change. And um, so that, th those are a few, Nick. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so transitioning now toward uh, something that happened recently, we just wrapped up Campaign Arkansas. Um, so that, that was an eight year drive, raised nearly $1.45 billion for the University of Arkansas. Um, within the College of Engineering, we raised more than $70 million and it funded all manner of major projects from scholarships to major construction like uh, the facility you're just alluding to, uh, faculty support and, and all kinds of other things. But one big part of being Dean that people may not think about as much is the role that Dean plays in a project like Campaign Arkansas. Yeah. You're out there, you're telling the story of our college, you're explaining the needs and the opportunities. So my question is, what have you learned during your time as Dean about the impact alumni make on a college? Um, well, to drill it down to a word, it's, it's transformational. You know, the gifts that when alumni choose and, and, and you're always mindful of this of a dean as a dean is that when a person or family decides to make a major gift they're literally taking that out of their estate and they're giving it to the university to make a difference and so be it building a new structures lab a new endowment for uh, scholarships for a certain discipline or be it an endowment for a faculty member or fellowship for a graduate student. These make a difference in people's lives. You know, and, and John White used to talk about this is, you know, these, it's, it's not about the dean. It's about the students. It's about the university. It's about giving back to something you love. And sometimes that drives philanthropic notes that people want to give. And sometimes it doesn't. You know, and so the role of the dean is just to know our alums, figure out what their passions and their visions are, and if, if it falls in their sweet spot of, of, of wanting to get to engineering, then you grant them the opportunity to get to give. And, and I'll tell you another thing, Nick, that I think people oftentimes think that, yeah, it, there's a lot of windshield time, there's a lot of time flying with the development team, like Kristen Ford, I see her front and forth foremost right there um and so we we were out a lot you know how many times have i been in bob harrison's house and a big steak dinner one night and i saw um uh well i can't i'll, I'll get sidebar but there's andy said it's andy hey andy how are you and spent time on the academy board what happens and i, I don't think most people realize this is as, as a husband, or uh, me and my spouse, and it happens to be a wife, Elizabeth, who you all know and love, you kind of fall in love with these alumni. That's what happens. They become your friends. So there's Larry Floyd. I knew him from UBC days and a loyal civil engineer. And I know him and Vicki from way back. Our kids were babies and cribs together. And, um, and that happens. And you know, and I go right down the list of, of everybody here. I see Chuck Tillman was one of my master students. I already mentioned Chris Weiser and flip pages, you know. It, it, so Nick, the thing that I want to heart, yes, transformational, bring people opportunity to have changed in lives. And the thing that I want to be crystal clear on, it is anything but a burden to a dean. You know, you build these wonderful circle of friends that I get to go to my grave with. And, uh, 
And I, I assume they're going to still be my friends when I come to BCR on BCRI on Monday. Uh, but um, it is a very it's one of the most rewarding. You know, I'm going to miss the faculty. I'm going to miss the staff. I'll miss the curricula of the students. My gosh, but I'll see students over here all the time. And I'm going to miss the alumni. I'm going to miss them deeply. And you better come see me because I'm going to be sad if you don't. And Chris, we got to eat Mexican food more often. And Bob, eat more steak once I can start eating steak again. Um, and Chuck, I know we'll keep in touch. Man, I can put it. Andy, I know we do IE. So, the risk right. of missing anybody, that's all the example. That's just a show on, on my page right now. That's perfect. That's perfect. Um, yep. Well, great. So, I know I have a feeling uh, you will be hearing from folks just judging by the number of uh, folks who came to this call today. So, I think that's a good thing. Um, I want to turn now to a topic that you've hit on and a topic that's certainly front of mind for everybody on campus, and that's diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, the, the state of diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus, it continues to be a major conversation. We hear about it from our students, we hear about it from our faculty, and we hear about it from our alumni as well. Um, and at, as you mentioned, it, it's no secret STEM fields in particular have been prone to a lack of diversity and inclusion, even, you know, compared to other fields sometimes. Um, but I, I think also for that reason, the College of Engineering has in some ways been a forerunner in some of these conversations because it has been such a point of focus. Um, and, and as you've mentioned, it's a point of emphasis during your time as dean. And you, you talked a, a, about some of the details, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about why this has been so important to you personally as dean. That's a good question, Nick. And this, is, this is actually hits uh, my heart. So if I get a little weak voice, just bear with me. Um, you know, I, I was department head for eight years, and this is my 14th year of being dean. I was very committed to, you know, personally seeing what I can do and making equity adjustments and being inclusive, pushing for diversity. And I mean, I, I was a good and faithful steward of those of those. But uh, Matt Waller and I, and actually um, our associate dean for student success, Brian Hill, came into my office one day when we used to meet face to face. Remember way back when we get to meet face to face, um, and he he handed me something, and now uh, hang tight. The title of the seminar was called White Men as Full Diversity Partners. I said, Brian, get this out of my office. This has no place in my office. I just imagine capes and hoods and something really bad going on, you know. And then I called my friend at another major university to, to find out this program. And that dean described transformation in view of himself, an epiphany in his personal life. And I said, well, Okay, I trust this guy. And so Matt and I packed up and we went to this, this um, uh, three and a half day event. And it was a deep immersion of the perspective of people who don't look like me in the workplace. And it was, it was, a, uh, it was an epiphany for me. And I'll tell you my faith and who I am and what I believe lined up in my commitment to diversity and inclusion. And that's where it comes from, Nick is it, it, was, it was an epiphany, it was an impression stamped on my heart that I lined up what I personally believe with what I've always known is the right space to work in. And I know that I'm, I'm, I'm very, very vocal about this on campus, but it's easy to be vocal when it comes from your heart and something that happened. And, um, and so with that, that's then laid out some programming we've done. Uh, we've done some microaggression training, um, unconscious bias training, all fitting nicely even within the executive order. I'm telling you, that's, that's, that's not what we're, we're not, we're not that's, that's, that's not an issue. Everything we've done is okay, because that's, it's, it's good. And, and I, there's one, one program that's been, I think, particularly impacting and these, those I work with daily. It's, it's called OUCH. It's a great 30 day, 30 hour, 30 minute training program. There's a little quiz at the end, but don't get nervous. Even I passed it, so it wasn't that big a deal. Um, but it, it really stimulated a lot of change in my direct, with the direct reports that I'm responsible for. And uh, it's about microaggressions and things that we do that oftentimes we don't have never even thought about. And, you know, I, 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 can, I can go right down the list of many ouches that I've self-imposed upon myself whenever I said something. I made a comment in a senior team meeting two weeks ago. I still feel bad about it. Uh, but, you know, as, as soon as those words came out of my mouth, 
it was a microaggression. Nothing wrong with my heart. There was nothing poorly meant of it. But I immediately, it was like, boom, you know, the heart connection to the brain said, ouch. And I said to one of the department heads, man, I was out of line. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't think. Sorry. And then I called him personally that night to apologize again. And so I see things like that occurring in, in, in those who I work with daily. And I, I am full intention of carrying that to the VCRI spot. And because uh, uh, I don't think you're going to drive it out of me. That's great. That's great. Um, so that, that's a kind of a nice transition here um, to our next topic, which is a phrase we obviously talk about a lot in engineering and one you're going to be talking about uh, perhaps even more, and that's research and innovation. Um, so re research has, of course, been a major focus during your time as dean. Um, College of Engineering faculty received about $34 million in research grants for fiscal year 2020. It was a record year. Um, and that's almost twice what the college brought in, even as recently as 2017. So my question is, what, what do you think is driving that growth, and how do we keep it going? Yes, that, that's a great question. And, you know, it, uh, a lot of things, Nick, when I think about that growth, it's certainly hiring world-class faculty and retaining world-class faculty. And you may think that, you know, I, let me just paint a picture of what a world-class faculty member looks like. Um, Gary Prince over in civil engineering. Right? Okay, career award winner. That's the big deal award for an early career faculty member. But also, since I'm the dean, I do all the reviews of promotion and tenure packages. And so I learned all about things they do. And what I discovered, what would have thought is just like this brainiac, which he is in the area of steel structures, okay, and knows the science behind the metallurgical aspect to the, the strength of steel beams. But he also is an amazing instructor. I mean, he does things. He, I saw him doing rap songs and for their design projects, things that this 62 year old would never ever come up with. But his relevancy and his ability to teach is, is second to none. And I've been Dean for a long time and Gary's not the only example of that. I go right down the list. I think of Lauren Greenlee over in chemical engineering who flipped an upper level chemical engineering course rather than being focused on the technical content, focused on the communication aspects and then taught the technical content from around the subject of being a good communicator. That's innovative folks. And so hiring faculty like Lauren, like Gary, and just go right down the list across the college. So you got the brain cells, you got the creativity, you've got the, 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 the stock there to do some great things. And then I think the responsibility of, of, of shepherding and supporting, starting with the department heads and the faculty and the staff supporting their ambitions to bring in research, to fund their scholarly activities uh, is, 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 is very important. It's a nurturing environment. Across, and it's very important as Dean that we see nurturing environments for these faculty members so they feel enabled, empowered. And, 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 and then similarly, the Dean's office Basically, our job is to build great processes and duck, you know, have some grantsmanship training, you know, show them where they can submit proposals, help them facilitate an interdisciplinary project. And Nick, I think I don't know yet, but, you know, I'm already trying to stick my toe in now the broader aspects of campus. You know, I think, you know, I was in a call last night with the deans and Dean McKay from the law school said, John, think about policy issues on research contracts and proposals. Bring the legal college, legal law school into your proposals. I had a great meeting with the chair of communications, Larry Foley. He reached out to me, making sure I've got any right side brain at all, in which I do have a little bit, just not enough to have enough talent to do it. I'm a frustrated musician, by the way, very sax player, but I still don't know my scale. So I've never gotten any better over the years, but I still play in a band, as a matter of fact. So I'm just frustrated on that right side, but I have a connection. And Larry wanted to meet with me, and he shared right here. I liked it so much, I've ordered three copies from University Press. Mike, are you proud of me? Mike Beaker that runs University Press is on this phone. And so I'm, I'm carrying this over to a friend of mine today. The title is Indians, Outlaws, Marshals, and the Hanging Judge, Hanging In Judge, the Arkansas vernacular. This is about uh, Judge Parker in the late and mid 1890s, uh, who was appointed by General Grant 
uh, to go to Fort Smith and stop the corruption of all the bad people attacking a lot of Native Americans just west of there doing bad stuff. I mean, killing people right and left. And he went in there and he straightened up Fort Smith. And it's a remarkable documentary. And as Dr. Foley was describing this, I'm not embarrassing him. I saw the same spark in his eyes as I've seen in faculty when they hit a career award. But when he described discovery through the National Archives, the original letter that General Grant sent to what was soon to be Judge Parker and then found Judge Parker's acceptance of that offer in the archives. I, 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 I've seen the same eyes in engineering. It is no difference. And so, Nick, I don't know how I'm going to do it all, but I think as I roll into the VCRI's job, we're going to broaden our purpose. We're going to engage the entire academy. I find it tremendously exciting. And I've got an appreciation for business and the sciences, you know, from, from my technical background. But then I've also, I think I've got, I've got a compass here that's already pulling those things out. And I, I, I think there's going to be scores of opportunities. In, and look, another great book I read was um, Hip Billies by Jared Phillips over in the history department. Growing up here, and, and I hope I'm sharing the vision here with the good examples. And so Jared was featured in our, our uh, daily news feed last week, or last year, about uh, this time, I think. Well, what caught my attention, he lives, he and his family live out in Prairie Grove. Well, that's my hometown. It's where I grew up. And so I said, Tristy, I'd like to meet Jared. And, and then I noticed the article was about this book called Hip Billies. I didn't really know what it was about. And I went to lunch. And what I learned was as a kid growing up here in Northwest Arkansas, I wondered who these people were with this, they had long hair, they really looked, you know, they, they, they weren't wearing a nice, beautiful red sport coat, okay? let's put it that way, all right? And, 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 and there's, well, I won't go into more detail. Those of you who grew up around here, I, we called them hippies. I didn't know who they were. Well, it turned out these were these were typically white collar people who had gotten fed up with all the 60s and the 70s from racial tension to the Vietnam War. And, you know, they said, I've had enough. We're going to move to the fertile soil of the Ozarks and we're going to go back to the land. And that's what they called them, uh, get back to the landers. And what they discovered is our fertile soil here in northwest Arkansas is about an inch deep and then you get rock. And, um, and now there are some good lands in lower river valley areas, but, you know, they discovered they had to work together. And the old food co-op, I remember as a kid going to down on West Avenue, and my dad worked at West Avenue Annex, and I used to see, like, you know, literally buckets of beans or a pile of homemade something or another, and these long-haired people running around, well, they were discovering how to create a food cooperative, and, 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 and utilize each other's strengths where they may have a piece of a farm over here that's suitable for apple orchards and this other place is more rich and lush and good to better for row crops. And they learn how to work together to provide a natural, a flow of natural food coming to Northwest Arkansas. And our own Jared Phillips wrote that book right here. And so I, I see great opportunity, Nick, to broaden this office and uh, certainly we've got our functional responsibility of being a research and sponsored program, uh, helping faculty submit proposals, receive funding, set up the research accounting. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity even in that space as we think about uh, proposals to like the National Endowment of Arts, uh, presidential uh, councils on certain aspects of history. Um, and I think we can help a lot. And I'm, I'm look, that, that's, those are some things that excite me. And then of course, in the last, thing that, that I must be mindful of is our IQR um, endowment set up by the Walton Family Charitable Foundation. Uh, almost $200 million is going to create a large building, a research building that's going to focus on five principal areas from supply chain to material science. And we'll be bringing, bringing in people that will help build an innovative and integrative so it's Institute for Innovative Integrators, IQ, the Chancellor's careful to say, uh, a research center. And so we'll be hiring people. We're going to be taking the university to a new level in view of getting more to that prototype space, 
you know, we've got ample basic research development, but taking it into launching into commercialization is a space that, you know, they liken this area uh, of Arkansas as the Austin of 30 years ago. It's ready to boom in view of economic development. And so I'm excited about it. It's not a space I know much about. You know, I mean, it's like if you're familiar with Georgia Tech, they have the GTRI uh, facility, which is basically works in space. And most top 10 programs have something like this. It's, it's very visionary on behalf of the university, the chancellor, and great, very grateful to the Walton family that are willing to support uh, our efforts to support this ecosystem in Northwest Arkansas. Also building a uh, Arkansas campus up in Bentonville, which we're very excited about to better engage with that thriving ecosystem of uh, northern uh, northwest Arkansas, and then also some support of some entrepreneurial activities within the Honors College. It's going to give rise to a huge impact for the university. So those kind of things I launched from leaving my first love. And by the way, I, I did, those of you know Julian Stewart, Julian was a civil engineering graduate, very, very deep heart. This is a tie he gave me. I have not worn it since he passed away. So I'm gonna go back and pick up on the affinity you learned for alumni. I thought I'd lost an uncle when Julian Stewart died. I just love that man deeply. And so as I launch from a place that I love deeply, I, I hope you get that. There's a reason why I do what I do. I get to come, I get to come back and be the dean of my alma mater. But I also find excitement as moving into this is frontier of research and innovation and um, bringing some uh, Heather Nachman is coming with me to help on some process. She's an amazing administrator. So we're going to tweak all the, we're going to be good industrial engineers. Not, you know, Chuck, we're going to, we're going to get in there. We're going to look at the functions that are needed on campus. We're going to look at the processes, we're going to look at improvements, we're going to look at organizational structure, mapping that to what we need to be doing. And we're, our goal is to soar in efficiency and efficacy uh, in the next three years. And, uh, and so that, those are kind of my visions. I'm kind of all over the board on that, Nick. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to walk in this row. I'm honored that, that the chancellor asked me to do it. That's all right. That, that's phenomenal. And yeah, that, there are about four or five things in there that uh, I, I, I could would love to follow up on. Um, but I, so I guess one of them is kind of going back to the data science program, and it ties into what you were talking about, about that sort of holistic educational approach. You know, the, the data science program is the first of its kind on the University of Arkansas campus. It's an undergraduate program, like you mentioned. It's offered across three separate colleges. Um, you know, the, this certainly was, was not the easiest way to set this program up. You could have just stuck it in one of the colleges and, you know, run it like any other program. But can, can you talk a little bit more about why the decision was made to structure it in that way? Well, yeah, and so it was, the, well, the whole inspiration came from a somewhat, a very tense meeting, we'll just say a big company up in Bentonville, whenever we discovered we were missing the boat on their need set. And, 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 and the concern was expressed that we just not finding what we need, and they were describing a data scientist. And so, and in that meeting, was Todd Shields, the, 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 our Dean of the uh, Fulbright uh, School uh, College of Arts and Sciences, and then what was then the Walton College of Business Dean, Eli Jones. And, we, and so we basically walked out of the meeting and said, my gosh, we have to do something. And so there was the inspiration. And then, we, then Matt Waller came in as the Dean of, of uh, the Walton College. And, and quite honestly, I don't have two better friends in life than those two deans. I mean, they are really, dear friends of mine. And, and as we began to pull the layers back on this, we realized this was much bigger than any one department and certainly, and even one college. And if we tried to pull it off by ourselves, it's gonna be unhealthy turf issues and hey, what about all these other aspects that are in data science now? And so I think that the key on this, Nick, was the inspiration that it was past time. I remember Charlie Morgan just beating me on the head about missing the boat on our ability to meet their technical needs at first Orion. And, and, then, and then the deep friendship and respect across the deans here at the University of Arkansas. And I, I mentioned the two that obviously I was partnering with, but I will tell you the deans here at the University of Arkansas, we are a team. I mean, and in fact, oftentimes you'll find in deans there's battles for turf. The prior biggest problem is we yield too much to each other. 
And, 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 there, and so as we moved into that, Nick, you had this inseparable connection between the three deans and then we put a crackerjack team of faculty together to, to explore what the world class programs and data science look like, modeled a lot like um, San Jose State, as a matter of fact. We went to Ohio State, uh, NC State, um, we went to the, all the obvious choices, uh, but it, you know, this thing was shaped up and then with a tremendous advisory council, you know, big data, data science executives from, from across the state and the region came in and weighed in on the curriculum. And so the inspiration, the connection of, of the deans, a fantastic group of faculty that crafted the, the curricula and, 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 and it was just, it was a wonderful experience. And then, oh my gosh, the university supported it financially. <laughs> you know, it comes down to you gotta pay the bills and uh, they were supportive in view of providing uh, perpetual funding to make sure this could happen. So tribute, shout out to Jim Coleman and, and Chancellor Steinmetz for making those things happen. Absolutely, excellent. Um, so, well, I, I want to take a couple of moments now to kind of ask you to reflect um, and not, not to be too melodramatic, but this is one of your last public events as Dean of Engineering. Um, and there are many people on this call who know you well. Um, so these questions are a little bit on the personal side, but the, what, what are you most proud of during your time as Dean? Wow, most proud of, gosh. The top thing I'm most proud of. Yeah. Calm down, heart. Okay. Um, the feeling of a team all around me, all around me, Nick. You know, the staff, the faculty, the students I know, the advisory councils. I mean, I don't know which group I enjoy more. And I, I have never felt so humbled to feel that in my organization that I've been granted the, the, the responsibility for. And I don't credit me for that. I credit for a whole lot of really good people who undergirded what we were trying to do in the college. They caught the vision of our strategic plan. Every, every group said, we're going that way now. And our strategic plan says we're going to prepare you for your tomorrow and totally got our hands around that everybody and uh, we're not perfect because I'm the dean I know that. Um, but, you know, I think that's the thing I'm most proud of is the feeling I have going in the office seeing students around our complexes when the advisory council I'm dying because advisory council is virtual on Friday just dying. You know, and because, you know, all aspects. And um, I think that would be, it seems kind of, it's not the numbers, but man, we're, we're on track for some, we've broken tons of records. No, those are good. That keeps me out of trouble with my boss. But the things I'm most proud of is the feeling I have in our college. And it has been incredibly rewarding with all humility. Yeah. That's great. Nick, that is would you like an outsider's point of view? <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> I'd like to say something, John. I think that the, uh, the the biggest thing that you did is you look at it in reverse of what you just said. You make everybody at the university, all the alumni, feel like you're their best friend, and you are in practice. Not just it's not a sham. No. The other thing is, it, it I have learned there's such a distinct difference between managers and leaders. And you're definitely a leader and people follow leaders. They, they bleed for leaders. And that's what you are. That's why you got this opportunity. Uh, I know I'm gonna miss you. I'm mad you're taking Heather with you. I didn't know about that one. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it's, it's uh, I guess in the reverse of what you were saying, it's how you make everyone else feel and how you inspire others just by being John. Thank you. Oh, so I wanted to, Jump in there and say that. I know it's not part of your thing, Nick, so I'm gonna, I'll hush it down. But... <laughs> That's all right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that was excellent. Um, well, yeah, so um, we'll, we'll kind of 
turn toward the future now. And you, you talked a little bit about uh, your role as vice chancellor for research and innovation, but um, so yeah, can, can you talk a little bit about what um, you, you see as kind of the early days being like in that role and kind of what, what your priorities will be? Yeah, um, and a lot of that is what Heather is joining me. And Bob, she's just 50%, by the way. So she's not full time over here. And so um, and so, what Heather and I will be doing, I, will, I obviously do the line responsibility. The reporting structure comes to me. Heather will be, and I know it sounds like a made up title, but it's really not, a senior associate vice chancellor. It sounds like we're running out of adjectives. But that establish her as the, like the number two person in the DCRI's office, but has no line responsibility. So I think the early years, Nick, and I, I'm sharing this openly with these folks, they're wonderful people over here. Uh, I mean, hardworking, overworked, they're, our new ERP system is killing them, you know? And, I, and so I say these things to not say they're broken per se, um, but I think there's, there's an opportunity to take a dive on how they operate and look at where, where the, the roles and functions match up with the organization. Are we sized right in the right places? You know, before we start trying to feed, you know, what we think are those blowing cues and we're not going to get the work done, exploding club cues, um, let's make sure we're doing it the right way. And so Heather's role in this capacity is going to be, you know, talking to people, getting to know what campus expects, what our capacities are, what the structure should look like. And so I think that within the first year, uh, we will likely see uh, some shifting in the way we're organized, some movement of where people's responsibilities lie. Um, I hope we start seeing people come back to campus. You know, uh, we need that. We need their community to come back safely. Um, and so I hope we'll see more lights turn on around the administration building and we're operating more efficiently. And I think the, the uh, you know, since I'm on the user side, um, you know, I, I know more of the challenges we've been faced with, but now I'm kind of going through the curtain and I'm gonna find out why there are challenges. And so my goal is to hope campus starts saying things like it last year, sometime next year is like, you remember we used to have those challenges? We're not having them anymore. You know, if we can get two or three of those, you know, with this great group of people that are over here, you know, uh, I, I'm telling you, I'm convinced it's, it's just some good IE work that needs to be done. And I think we can squeeze out more work and broaden our purpose and, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're, we're flying. And that, that's, that's, and then in the long run, you know, see IQDAR up and having national impact, um, hitting records in view of all things in scholarly activities. And I said that very carefully, it's not just about the money and the journal pubs. Uh, guilty as charged, that's what engineering deans do. We count those things all the time. So what we do, we count that and we look at impact. But this, this office has got, is, is, I think the fun part is going to get broader, broader. And I think that, that, I think we're all excited about that. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and then no doubt that you will find success in that role. Um, so we, we've got about 15 minutes left here. Um, just got one or two more questions on my end. If uh, folks want to start dropping some questions in the chat, we will uh, take a look through some of those. Um, but in the meantime, it wouldn't be a uh, lunch and learn during 2020 without me at least mentioning COVID-19. Um, so the, the details of the college's response to COVID have been pretty well reported, but I, I'm mainly interested in what leadership lessons you learned during your time leading the college through COVID. Yeah. You know, I think the big one on that, Nick, is, <clears throat> you know, I know this is a surprise to everybody on this meeting, in this meeting, but we're pretty structured around the university. We're pretty hierarchical. Uh, we, we kind of have a process and policy for about everything you could ever imagine. And we had nothing on how to go through COVID-19, nothing. And, you know, I'm, I'm a professor for a reason that I love being a professor. We're, you know, we're respectfully insubordinate all the time. I mean, that's, that's our nature. You know, my mom always said my theme song was my way as a kid. And 
it's pretty much proven to be true even as dean. Um, but, you know, so we, and, and I love faculty governance. I really do. I love to go to faculty senate meetings. I love to go to faculty meetings. I, I, that's what I love. It's what I do, you know. But when COVID-19 hit, it was a beast we didn't know how to deal with. It, it, we didn't have time to put this out in governance committees, though we did have some COVID-19 campus-wide committees that helped build guidelines and help direct, but we had to move faster than that. I mean, it came March the 12th, ironically, which was my birthday. And the only thing I wanted to do on my birthday was eat lunch with our grandkids in Olathe. And, and sure enough, as, and I turned my phone off from 11.30 to one, I get back in the car and I have a text from Brian Hill say, it's happening. And uh, so from March 12th, after lunch, we had to find a way in nine days to open up campus virtually. And it, you don't have time for committee governance in doing that. And so how do you manage that one and stay true to our virtues and our behavior as faculty members, as it's, it's what we are, me, I'm just a grown up faculty member, is, is we had to manage by guiding principles and you know and 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 so we started rolling those things out nobody should feel unsafe nobody should feel like somebody's taking advantage of power differential the deans unified very quickly on a set of principles we're going to protect jobs and salaries at all costs and we're going to link we'll help each other out we told campus if it comes down to caring because there's a lot of anxiety back in march and april and going into may and so that's it was it was guiding principles and we just kept that going and going and i think i learned that more than anything else and i think everybody on campus in in all leadership roles whether you're running a lab or or supervising uh, the front office of the academic department we've all learned that we had to be broader we could not come up with enough policies and like jim collins says when the bus is heading the right way you don't need a bunch of mindless bureaucracy and policies and we didn't have time to write the policies. And so there was only one way we had to, to, to and, and I, you know, quite honestly, I made more decisions by myself than I ever have in my entire 32 plus years in the academy. I mean, there were times I just had to execute and explain it from guiding principles. And, and then I think another one too, Nick, was communication has never been more important. And, and Nick, you've helped me a lot. And, and getting the word out, and uh, you have, and uh, uh, because I think that helps more than anything else. I so many comments of people who have just appreciated hearing from my office, you know, what's going on, and we didn't do it perfect. I missed some big things that I got nailed for, but you know, we sure did communicate a lot, and I think that that probably now, as the president of Purdue has said. We, turning campus back on is nothing compared to turning it off. This is the challenge of challenges. And I know we're not alone. I imagine every company and organization on this phone is facing the same thing. How are we gonna turn our university, your university back on? Uh, because that's, that, that is a challenge. We must get students back. We must get that college experience going again, but we've got to do it safely and be mindful of what we know, our best practices. Um, unfortunately, we've had a big test bed in K through 12, and we see what happens whenever social distancing and masks are worn. And so uh, we're looking at some new paradigms, guiding principles on what the classroom's gonna look like. Certainly, um, we're, we are going to be offering face-to-face -face courses, 100% face face-to-face. And certainly it's going to take a room four times the normal size. And so, you know, a big course in chemistry is not feasible. We don't have anything in Northwest Arkansas big enough to hold 350 students. Uh, but our smaller classes, we're moving hard at having 100% face to face, but then accommodating whenever a student gets sick or a faculty member gets sick. We'll have those, those will be lect those lectures will be recorded and will support students who, who have documented reasons to be away from class because we got to get turned back on and it could turn on a second back to shutting it down if this spike turns out to be real. So we're watching those, we central administration is watching those numbers deeply. Sure.
So yeah, guiding principles and communication. I think I already knew those things, but I really learned them this year. There you go. Yep. All right. So we, we've got a, a question here from Ted Dickey, and it's uh, in, in light of faculty responsibilities for teaching and research, how could the U of A encourage and support faculty efforts to pursue commercialization? And it's a great question. And, um, you know, it's one that a, my opinion, not every faculty member wants to do that. In fact, what I, as I go on to some of the big programs, but I'd be name dropping if I mentioned them, you know, but I've been to several talking about this very issue, Ted. And it's typically five to 10%. Now I'm talking engineering, it's all I know right now. It's only five to 10% that really want to move into that space. And so the challenge there is to pulling that talent out. And also, I think bringing in talent, one of the wonderful things about IQGAR, we're going to be able to bring in some talent in this space also. So this new talent, and we're talking about a director, uh, three uh, chairs of the five areas and 20 faculty members. So it, it's transformational for this campus on the number of new faculty that are coming in and they work in this space and they're likely to come from universities who have, you know, great, I don't, I don't name drop, but they, they, you go to places like was it, Purdue and Georgia Tech and UT Austin, they have these enterprises, but 90 to 95% of their faculty are not participating. They're out doing their basic research and science and scholastic activities. They don't want to do that, but those who do can be can be tremendous facilitators. So we bring in folks that are already doing this, working with those who want to do it more, and working with the vice chancellor for economic development making sure we have the pockets necessary to launch these startups um that's 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 what we're looking at and and we have a lot of faculty who do this we've got startups right here in our back door that have come out of our faculty and never forget it's not necessarily the faculty oftentimes it's their graduate students that come in and, and want to launch the company in fact we've got a board policy a faculty member cannot be the ceo of a startup they can be at most a CTO. And rightfully so, that's a conflict of interest to run a company and still be full full time employee as a faculty member, because their fundamental charter is to teach and bring and, and, and do their scholarly efforts and serve the professional community. And so it's going to be a balance, but we're going to bring in some thoroughbreds to work with some of our thoroughbreds and try to pull it out. That's a good question. And remember, I'm minus four days in the job right now. Okay, so I, I, the, the depth on this was pretty light, Dad. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we are down to our last five minutes here, so um, I want to be sure to give you an opportunity. If there are any uh, kind of parting words you'd like to share, you know, we've got a lot of alumni in this call, and there's certainly a lot of new people from the VCR office as well. So, and anything you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah, Nick. I think. Um, you know, as a, as a fellow alumnus, um, I encourage you to take ownership in, in our university. You know, it's, 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 well, I am one of you, so this is like weird to say this, but it's, it doesn't belong to any administrator or faculty member or staff member. The university is the sole property of its alumni. That's my view on it. And you have a, we all have a deep responsibility. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here of, of, of caring for her and propping her up, giving of your time, talents, and resources as you're so inclined and able to do. You know, uh, serve on advisory councils, get involved with the Alumni Association. And, you know, and the easiest thing you can do if you're not a lifetime member of the Alumni Association, do that. You know, commit to Brandy that you're going to be a lifetime member of the Alumni Association. And I tell you, the younger you are, the better value it is. You never have to pay the membership fee again. You know, so when Sarah graduated from one of her degrees, that's her daughter, I gave her a lifetime membership to Elizabeth and I gave her a lifetime membership to the Alumni Association. I think that's kind of a pledge of allegiance to the university. That should be critical to all alums to, 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 to say, I am in. I'm in, I'm in for the long haul. And I'm a lifetime member of the Alumni Association. I'm gonna serve when asked to serve. I'm gonna provide feedback when not asked. <laughs> you know, you just remember, I, 
all all of us who have been faculty who are faculty members we're very used to getting feedback whether asked or not and so you know when you think we need to know something let us know you know you take ownership in this place and um i know i do you know i mean i i i this place is just wonderful you know i, I made an attempt even in covid to walk around campus and uh and so i think that would be the biggest thing take ownership because you are the owner that's excellent. Well, um, you know, if, if there's anyone who wants to drop any notes for Dean English in the chat, certainly feel free. We can uh, get all those to him afterward as well. But uh, I, I think that'll do it. So on Dean okay. English, on behalf of everyone on this call and everyone in the College of Engineering, uh, thank you for everything you've done for our college. We wish you all the best in your new role. Um, and we certainly appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Well, it's been my, my pleasure and I haven't died nor have I moved. I've just moved across <laughs> campus. Okay. So uh, <laughs> we'll still see everybody. So thank you, Nick. And thank you all for taking up your time to join us here.